and welcome to The Executive Appeal, a show that convenes the world's most powerful and successful leaders to share mentoring and career advancement advice to help you successfully transition into senior level executive positions. I'm your host, Alex Trumbull, award-winning speaker, author, and leadership expert with over a decade of experience coaching and advising some of our nation's most senior level government leaders. So if you're ready to reach your goals, let's get started. Hello everyone, this is Alex Trumbull, and today, today is a good day. See, today we have with us Mr. Damien Jones. Damien serves as the global head of diversity and inclusion for Bayer Company. Yes, the Fortune 500 Bayer. And I know this is going to be a great conversation. Time today. How you doing, kind sir? I'm doing great. Doing great. Happy to be here. Hey, hey, hey D- Damien, I wanted to ask you. Sure. Um, I can see your background. I can see you have a lot of books behind you. And, 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 if, and if the number of books has <laughs> any correlation with, with how smart you are, you are a genius and Albert Einstein has nothing, nothing on you. So <laughs> I want to <laughs> just gonna start this off. Hey, what's your favorite book? I, I, this is one thing I was wondering and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so my default setting on that oftentimes is, is, is the Bible, you know, uh, and that's as a function of my faith, my belief. Um, very insightful, keeps me kind of grounded on some of the things, the why I do what I do. And, and, um, and yeah, so I would say that one. Okay. So then how about after the Bible? Okay. After that one. Um, (laughs) no, it's a great question. One of my favorite books I think is, um, by Peter Singe, the fifth discipline. Um, because that one, I became familiar with it in grad school and it was just one that really helped shape a lot of my thinking, uh, which I do apply to inclusion and diversity uh, and equity and access. It's something that I think is um, critical because it helps you think more broadly and more strategically about how to apply these things and to think in the terms of systems as opposed to specific instances or, you know, singular perspectives. So I I wanted to start off with the the book question, one, because you are, you do have a phenomenal library behind you. Um, But two, you know, books is one of those interesting things because it allows you to learn the, I was almost like the, the reader's digest of anyone who wrote the book, right? Like, like they went through all these experiences, they write all this research and they're kind of condensing it for you. Um, and you are consuming it and it's, it's, it's kind of being melded into you as a person. Mm-hmm. My, my question is, is, you know, there are thoughts about, you shouldn't read things that are in alignment with your way of thinking because it could then feed into you. But on the other side, there's a thought that you should read and consume um, perspectives that are, that are opposite of what you may think um, because it allows you to understand different perspectives. Where do you stand on you know, how you consume information and how it should impact you as a leader? That's a great question. I would say... Um, there's two thoughts I have on that. One is I think it depends on your maturity level, um, which, which, and what I mean by that is uh, as the first thought, if you can handle different perspectives without being taken out of yourself, so to speak, if, for example, if you can evolve Mm -hmm. yourself without losing yourself, then feel free to engage a lot of different perspectives to understand different points of view, because my firm belief is that you don't really understand yourself until you understand yourself in the context of others. Mm -hmm. So from that vantage point, that also includes ideologies. You know, what are, what are the ideological perspectives that you have that you've adopted over the years and how do those things hold up in the face of maybe an oppositional or different perspective? You don't know that until you've engaged it. Um, But then there are people who on the basis of, again, maturity, who may not know how to consume those things without losing themselves or without having their whole worldview crushed by something to the point where they think they've lost perspective, right? So I think if you're mature enough to handle those different perspectives, absolutely engage them. Um, and, and that's that second point, right? If, if maturity is established, then yeah, go and engage and, and, and connect and read. Then you can understand why you believe what you believe. I think it's hard to understand it if you haven't faced, uh, countered it or, or dealt with anything that was a different perspective. I, I'm hoping, I don't forget this word, but you said maturity. Um, I, 
I am a proponent of what I call Franken mentorship, um, mm -hmm. which is instead of having one mentor and it's doing exactly what that one mentor has done and says do, you may have a almost like a board of mentors mm -hmm. and approaching different mentors about this and then getting different perspectives on the same problem, so on and so forth. Um, and it always works really well for me, but I know that there are many people who've said, hey, that's really hard because I'm, this person said I should do this and this person said I should do that and there are different things. How do I decide? It sounds like that comes down to that, that maturity to a level. Um, mm -hmm. how, do you build, how do you build maturity so you can process different, these pieces of information come from different places? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think um, these are all great questions, but uh, <laughs> one of the things that I would say is um, just to hit on the issue around mentorship, I think everybody in their development as a, in their career and leadership or whatever needs to have at least several groups of people in their circle. You need, oftentimes we do have our cheerleaders that really encourage us. They know our strengths and weaknesses and they kind of help with us. They encourage us. Um, you need to have your mentors who can help you and, and provide guidance and sometimes coaching and things of that nature. You also need sponsors. You need that person. And that's where a lot of times historically underrepresented groups don't always have the same mix. And the sponsors are the people who are really advocating for you. They're the ones that are putting their reputation on the line to advocate for your next development experience or opportunity. Um, and, and sometimes we don't always have those. Yeah. Um, and then and then you, you have your peers uh, who, who you're working with. And I think your supporters, your workers, the people who are in your circle who help you do what you do better, right? Who's in your circle that um, I need to get access to this data or these insights? Who can I reach out to? And I know they can give me what I need, right? So in your working environment, you do need these multiple groups. So I just wanted to reinforce your comment around Franken mentoring, because I would call that the same thing. In terms of the maturity and what can you do to get more mature to handle those things, if you've got those people in your circle, I think you're, that's part of the, the opportunity that you have is to struggle with all of that. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, mm -hmm. I heard this one mentor say this, not sure how I feel about it. It's great to have another perspective that you can go and say, here's, here's why I'm struggling with it. Or, or here's what is causing me to struggle. Do you have a perspective on me that will help me understand either why I'm feeling that way or maybe even help reinforce what they've said and maybe present it to me in a different way. I think the idea there becomes you, I think the important thing is to wrestle with it. Yeah. Um, I think the lack of maturity comes when we refuse to wrestle with things. We just take what's comfortable, what feels good, what's, what, what is com you know, our comfort level and we don't wrestle. I think the, the maturity comes with the rest. That that's, that's huge. That's huge. I, I, I was, so my wife, I mentioned this the other day for someone who's maybe listening to the, the podcast right now. My wife asked me, why do I seem to go after challenging projects? Like I, I'm, I'm huge with going after things that are hard and difficult. I don't want the easy stuff. Um, I told her that I, I go after those types of projects because it forces me to learn. Yes, I can learn from a book. Yeah, I can learn from watching a course. But if I throw myself into it, I'm, I'm, I'm giving everything I got it makes me learn how to do something differently. Right. Um, and it allows me to check myself when I'm lying to myself, like, oh, I'm, I'm not good enough. Oh, no, I, I've, I've shown I can be good enough. I, 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 I took this on. Um, and what you just said, she pointed out, she said, well, but in order to take that approach, in order to go after things that are hard and difficult, you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. You have to know, like, hey, this is not going to be easy. And right. I, I don't know how, I don't know how you do that except by doing it. Like, how do you become yeah. more resistant? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's no, um, yeah, there's no, there's no launch. Um, there's no launch pad for jumping out of the plane. You just jump out of the plane, right? There's not a specific place you got to stand, just get out. Right. And I think that's, um, that's the case with a lot of development experiences and opportunities that we have is, um, you, you, the, the, the learning comes in the going. Um, yeah. You, you know, you, you said you've, you talked about learning multiple times already and, and we've just started recently and you, you've mentioned learning like five, six, seven times, I believe. And 
I heard you make a, a statement before you said um, something to the effect of like um, lifelong learner is recognizing that, in, that the information you know is probably incorrect. And mm-hmm. you go on, um, you go on to say that even in the best circumstances, the information you know is probably incomplete. Um, yeah. I, I loved that that quote from you. And then it, it, it jogged my, my, my mind to a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he mm-hmm. says, one of the great challenges, one of the great challenges in life is knowing enough to think you're right, mm-hmm. but not enough to know you're wrong. Yeah. And, and, and so like, that that's a, it's like a difficult place to be if you're always questioning yourself. Like, aren't we told to be confident and, sure. and to know where, how do you, how do you do both? Well, I, you know, it's a great, yeah, that, that's an even better question. I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with being confident. Um, and sometimes your confidence can be in your willingness to see it through. Uh, it doesn't have to be in your sense that you have the absolute answer from the very beginning. Um, and, and I think what if you and I think from that vantage point, you can still adopt the principle that the, that the learning can be in the going. Right. Um, the other thing I think is important, too, is, is people surrounding yourself with people who can help you question yourself. Right. And I think that's where it gets into this issue of diversity and organizational culture and things of that nature. The idea is you don't want a team of people who see it exactly like you see it, yeah. um, think exactly how you think, because you probably share blind spots, too. So, the, excuse me, the opportunity becomes. Who, who, what's the right configuration of people that I need around me to help me do the things that to take on the challenges that I think we as an organization, I as an individual, we as a team need to take on and then you can get the perspective and take, be open to the feedback when it comes in of the things you may need to do different. Um, and, and I think as long as you take that approach that it is, you know, bi-directional, you can then begin to grow <clears throat> and learn better how to effectively lead. I've been in situations where um, what was needed of me was a definitive decision and a direction. Um, and I've been deemed in situations where I gave people choice in areas they really shouldn't have had it. They needed me to just make a call yeah. and it would have been a lot easier. Um, and then there have been in situations where uh, maybe I made the call and didn't engage enough people in the right way at the right time. And so even if it was the right call, I don't ha- necessarily have their support as much because they didn't like how it was made. Right. So it's a very nuanced thing as you're growing, as you're moving forward to really understand you know, what's the right thing to do at the right time. But I think what's helpful to sum it up is to say, surround yourself with people who can help you as you're progressing, as you're moving, um, and then, and be open to that feedback, but then have confidence in the journey, have confidence in your ability to see it through, um, as well as the things that you know you're competent on that have led up to that point. Do do you have any maybe tools or strategies on how you go about putting those right people around you. And I, I say it because years ago, I, I worked with this individual who they wanted to hire a particular person. And I could tell they wanted to hire that particular person because mm-hmm. it was a safe choice. Yeah. It was more like that person. And right. in that situation, um, the manager actually weighed in and was like, you know what? I actually think you need to hire the other person, which is a completely different personality. Mm-hmm. And turns out that was exactly what they needed. They needed that, that, but, but they weren't able to check themselves. It was a mandrake. How, how do we check ourselves to make sure that we are not falling in for the whole, they are like me kind of situation? Well, again, I think it falls back into that situation. I mean, in a way the answer was right there. It was the manager, right? Who was the person mm-hmm. who's in the, who's the person in your life that is, that has permission Right. And and I think that's an important piece. Who has permission to give you corrective feedback? You know, for you, it could be your wife. For that person, it was their manager. Who is the person who has permission in your life to give you corrective feedback? Or have you cultivated or created a culture 
where that gets penalized, where that's not okay, right? And that's where you start getting into that group think uh, type of perspective where even when everybody around you knows it's wrong, nobody wants to tell you because you're not open to it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you have to be, especially as a leader, intentional about that and saying, look, you know, we're a team. Um, give me feedback. If something's not going right, I want to hear about it. I don't want you to feel like you can't say it to me. Um, and if I feel like things are not going right, I'm going to tell you. Right. So we're going to create a trust in, in this relationship. Yeah. Um, because I think it is relationship that makes the difference. Um, so what's the nature of the relationship you have with your team and the people that are around you? That's where you'll be able to address the blind spots you may not even know you have. Man, I, it, it, this is why you're in this, this, this big flashy position. See, because um, <laughs> he, he, he got, got all these, these knowledge truth bombs drop. Um, so I, there is a question that I wanted to run by you. Um, and I, I don't mean to make a hard left turn, but it, it's, it's somewhere. It's in the same vicinity right in the same street um so more and more i have been hearing from leaders who want to do the right thing who want to grow and 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 test their boundaries on what's right and what's wrong but in today's society they they feel just really nervous that they're going to mess up oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> so you you see you know where I'm going. So yeah, yeah. I, I recently wrote an article for um, for ATD Associate for Talent Development, specifically about you know creating safe places for leaders to try stuff and not be and not be demonized if they got something wrong. Um, what is your experience? And have you one? Have you heard of that going on? And what are you doing? Or have you thought about anything to to create those spaces? Yeah, so I, I, it's, you know, it's a very relevant issue today, especially in the current culture, which people talk about things like cancel culture, things of that nature. I think the perspective I have on that is if you're a leader or in a leadership position, and I kind of tend to take the um, perspective that all of us are on some level, doesn't matter what your title is, mm-hmm. um, you can set the tone in an environment if you're willing to and, and feel strongly enough. I think the opportunity for people is to stop saving face. I I think we, I think, and there are very various cultural things that can come into play there, but I think for leadership, especially now current leadership, effective leadership, inclusive leadership, um, and, and I would say competent leadership, you have to be willing to lead vulnerable, you know, from a place of vulnerability, because here's the reality. You don't know all the answers. Yeah. Um, you don't always know the right direction. You aren't going to uh, be able to anticipate everything, but yet we still need to move forward. And so how do you help us do that um, without uh, being willing to take on those roles? Um, I remember uh, one a great example I saw of this is um, uh, a gentleman um, who was a leader um, in our company uh, previously, uh, before we were acquired. And he was speaking to a group of leaders um, who were high potential leaders, people we were training. And we had gone through this really tough period where uh, there was a huge change in the market. China had flooded the market with a certain key chemical that we were, we were producing and kind of known for. And you know things had changed, that business had changed. Um, and, and the big question to senior leadership at the time was, did you not see this coming? You know, what happened? And that was the, just the flood of questions that were coming in. And he kind of read the room and said, you know what, if at the core of these questions, you're looking for who to blame, blame me. You know, we could have seen it. We didn't see it coming. Yeah. However, now that we're here, we have a better view on how where we need to go from here and we need you to help us get there, right? So, and so there comes a point where, you have to kind of cut past the the words, the the logic, which you think may be the logic and deal with the fact that there's an emotional element here. And that once somebody takes ownership of it and says, you know what, I messed up, or you know what, um, these are things that I'm still learning too. So I, I welcome your input to help us. I still think we can get there. I still think we can get to a better place. 
and and I, I and I have confidence in it. But it's not just because of me; it's because of all of us, and we all need to work together to get there. So, I take that feedback. I take ownership. Now let's move forward. I think when when leaders try to downplay the concerns of employees, or they try to downplay something, or they try to delegate the responsibility of things, or even delegate culture, that's when you find the disconnect and you don't have the credibility and you do lose face despite your effort to save it. And that's when things go, go wrong. Well, that's, that's, that's an awesome answer. Um, so I'm, I'm asking great questions. You're asking, you're giving even better answers. <laughs> um, and, and you, you mentioned a word that has, it's, it's definitely tied to leadership, but it's also tied to, to, the possible downfall to someone's career, um, sure. which is ownership, right? Yeah. Um, taking ownership can be risky if you're not in the right culture, right? And, and, and an organization could could say, oh, yep, yeah, you're right. You did it. Got it. You're gone. So right. how do you know? I mean, is it just like a, a values thing? I'm just always going to take ownership or are there times where you sh- should be more lax on saying I completely did. Like, well, yeah, 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 we're being real. I just, you, know, you have careers. Absolutely. Here's my thing. I, I'm not a big fan of taking ownership of things you don't need to be taking ownership of. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of telling it like it is. And so, and I, you know, um, I think there's value in conversations, no matter what the direction, up, down, to the side of, of really, you know, having a truthful, honest conversation what is the core issue that we're dealing with here? There, and I've had this, I've had conversations like that with my management, with, with managers. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, I, I, this is what I call these conversations. I realize that it has a religious tone to it and I'm not attempting to address that part of it, but I call them come to Jesus conversations. You know, <laughs> in other words, mm-hmm. you know, you, being a truth teller is important. And sometimes I've had to tell the truth to my managers and say, here's what happened. You know, here are the parts that I absolutely take ownership of. Here are the parts that I think contributed beyond my efforts. And if we're going to solve for the future, I think we need to address them all. Now, I'm not absolving myself of the piece that I need to own. At the same time, I can't own the whole thing because it's not, it's not all me, right? And I think that's just as important as owning the piece that you should own. Right. So, yeah, I don't believe in what I felt like you may have been alluding to, which is this idea that as a principal, just own it all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that's not first of all, it's not honest. Um, and even if you're in the senior most levels of leadership. Right. You know, and, and this particular person happened to be a pretty senior leader. Um, but I, I think it's about being a truth teller and being honest about it. And then you can engage people because um, whether they intellectually know it or not, people feel the honesty of what you're saying. You know, what's funny is I actually just had this, this conversation with my wife this mm. week um, because she was, she, she was calling BS. And again, I guess I was, I, I learned, she was mm-hmm. like, look, you know, a leader just saying it's my responsibility because I'm, I'm the leader. She felt like that was a little pompous. And I was mm. like, yeah, but at the end of the day, doesn't everything, aren't you really responsible? I mean, if it's below, you, below quote unquote, if it's right. in your chain, aren't you technically responsible for it? And so we had that back and forth. And, and it sounds like, again, please correct me. It sounds like you should be very, as a leader, you should be very intentional with what you take responsibility for. doesn't mean you're right. not taking responsibility. You're just saying you're being very intentional. Yeah. Being intentional. And, and I think there is, there is, if, if we think about the process of what it takes to be accountable, to be self-accountable and to be intentional about your reflections on your role in something, the higher up in the organization you go, the broader that reflection needs to be because you're less able to say, well, that wasn't me because you're right. It was your chain of command. So somewhere, somewhere in there, that decision can be traced back to you on some level, you know, even if it was a bad hire <laughs> that you made. Yeah. 15 years ago, you couldn't have known or, 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 or if it was, so there is, I think a broader point of reflection to be able to say, what is it that I allowed and, or didn't pay attention to that caused us to get to the place where even though this may have occurred two to three levels below me or more or beyond that was allowed to happen. 
right? I think there is a, philosophically as a leader at a certain level, you should be thinking about that, right? Mm -hmm. Because now you have to be extra intentional to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Right. So I, I'm not saying don't take responsibility on those areas. You absolutely need to, but it's got to be the appropriate kind of responsibility. You know, you didn't directly do it, but you've now got to directly affect it to ensure that it doesn't happen again and set a new tone. And so that's the part where that responsibility comes in as well. You, you know, I was, um, but you don't know, but I was meditating the other day and mm-hmm. um, th- there was something that had gone on recently where um, there was an employee who did something and we were trying to work with that employee to, to, to correct the action. And it occurred to me, I had a responsibility in it too. Um, I, at a, at a more senior level position, I should have put certain place, for certain checks in place. Um, right. that, again, it wasn't for me to, to knock myself and to give the other person the out, but it was right. to say, there are things I could have done differently Mm-hmm. Um, there's these things I could have done differently. I think, and sure. I think it, it makes me feel like we're going full circle back to that lifelong learner um, mm-hmm. uh, concept that you're, you're, you're consistently talking about, which is mm-hmm. knowing that knowing that there's always something you can learn from a yeah. situation. And, and that's and that's where it becomes a thing of, like you said, you don't bang yourself on the head for what you didn't know, but you say, okay, now that I know it, does this, what what does this mean now for how I go forward? You know, what are the things that I'm going to be more intentional about as I'm setting the tone, as I'm uh, setting a direction and and creating a culture that include this experience so that we can forego this happening in the future um, so that it's very clear what the expectations and and so forth are. Yeah. So, you know, I've been wanting to ask you, so you're in a very interesting situation, Um, Mm -hmm. I say situation, shouldn't say like that. Um, but in your role, um, sure. you have dealings across the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that most individuals, most leaders are probably have a challenge and primarily focus with the culture of their team. Yeah. Just making sure their team is good. Right. Let alone the culture of the team across various states, across various countries. Right. I, I, I love to see and understand maybe how do you approach doing your job knowing that there are different cultural expectations across the, the entire company because you're because you're 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 worldwide right yeah how, how do you approach this <laughs> yeah uh when i figure that out i'll tell you um <laughs> <laughs> yeah i am not i'm not gonna presume to have answers for all these questions that are particularly great um it, it's it is a challenge i think from my point of view it comes down to and even as i approach this um this role, um, it comes down to who are we, right? Who do we say we are? What's our mission? At Bear, we say health for all, hunger for none. Uh, from an inclusion and diversity point of view, in my mind, that means the all and the none are very core to who we are. So then that has implications for how we treat things, how we address things. I think about, for example, uh, the diversity in, um, in clinical trials and making sure that we're in, being as representative as we can for who's involved so that we can maximize efficacy, particularly on things regarding our pharmaceutical and our consumer health business. Uh, This has implications for who do we give exposure and access to our technology to when it comes into the issues affecting, for example, black farmers, uh, Hispanic farmers, Asian farmers, female women farmers. You know, what are we doing to ensure access to technology, um, awareness of new things? How are we engaging those groups? That's a fundamental question of who we are as an organization. And in starting that work, that's the thing that I think becomes the foundation for who we are globally. Now, how that gets executed and leveraged in local environments is going to vary, right? Because uh, if you go to China, and I've had conversations with a number of my colleagues uh, who who lead this space uh, with European-based companies, 
um, if you go to China, you may have more female leaders there as we do than we do men, right? So maybe the gender piece from a leadership point of view, from an equity point of view may not be the same level of focus, but you may still have issues around disability, yeah. right? Because what you're dealing with there is, uh, as I've talked with my team, a lack of infrastructure, not just in within Bear, but in even in the cities, you know, it's very difficult for a person with a disability to get on a bus and travel and come into the office. It's very mm -hmm. difficult mm -hmm. for the, you know, those things. And so that becomes their focus. So the who we are can be global. The execution of how we manifest that in these different locations can be as specific as they need to be. And I think that's that balance of the, what I call the global, uh, in, in the simplest terms I can state it. Um, and, and you just have to navigate that balance. You, you know, there, there are two questions I want to squeeze in. I know, I know we only have so much time together today um, before you go hop in a private jet and talk to the president of some country and, you know, yeah. shake, some, shake some elbows and rub some hands or something like that. Uh, that's going to happen. Because <laughs> 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 I, 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 the first question I wanted to ask you was, you and I had a conversation before sure. and you mentioned the concept of teaching leaders the difference between intent and outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if you remember that conversation or if, if even if you remember that, that thought, um, if you do, you can just weigh in, but I, I can prompt it if, if you need me, want me to. Yeah, I, I, I remember that. I think is um, the way I kind of termed it was the difference between intent and impact. In, yes, um, yes. And, and I think the idea there is, um, and especially in the current times, right, um, going back to censorship, cancel culture and things of that nature, I think that the opportunity for leaders today is to say, is to recognize just because your intent was good doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you, you have the permission or the ability, the right to ignore the impact because your impact may not have been your intent. Uh, and, the, the, and, and that's not even just a leader thing. That's just a person thing. You know, if we're connecting with people who have different opinions, different perspectives, different thoughts, um, what's the, in, you know, it's good for you to know your intent and it's good for you to share what that intent is. But you also need to be open to the fact that your impact may have been very different. If I send a missile, you know, to one country and Motion it hits another, that other door. country doesn't care what my intent was. They're going to want to talk to me about the impact I had, understandably so. And so as individuals in, in, uh, connecting with each other, if I make a comment and I say something that's offensive to you, then you, you, know, you giving me feedback gives me the opportunity to understand that there's a distinction between those two things mm -hmm. and the accountability that I have to reconcile that. Um, I don't get to discount you just because my intent was good. Yeah. I, 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 I loved, I loved when you said that. I, I, I've been, I was going to say I've been quoting you, but obviously I've been quoting you incorrectly. But um, <laughs> intent impact, I, I, I love the I love the concept. And then I want to ask you, you know, you the people who are listening to these to these these episodes, um, these talks are individuals who who know there's there's something in their life that they want more. They they want more of something. And generally, in this topic, we were this the space we're talking about leadership and career advancement and things like that. And and you know, I had a mentor. Um, told me before I took one of my last jobs, he said, if you feel like you're ready for that job, it's not the right job for you. Hmm. You, need to, you, need, you need to dream yeah. bigger, go, go, go bigger. Yeah. Um, and so I, I want to ask you, do you think you've been, you are ready for this, this the, the position that you're in right now? And then I'd love to, yeah, I mean, let me wait there. Do you, were you ready for the position that you're in right now? Yes and no. Um, yes, because I had the subject matter expertise. I had a, uh, a systematic thinking about how to do things and what we needed to do. And mm -hmm. little to nothing of what I've proposed has been something that's been countered by best practicing thinkers in the space. Mm -hmm. That being said, the no comes in in my ability to as I heard one manager tell me and giving me feedback, elevate myself beyond facilitation to leadership. 
Um, and, and there's this element of being able to, it's one thing to get the right voices in the room to think about the concepts of how we need to move forward and to yeah. implement. It's another thing to really be able to drive it from one area to the other, especially when there's an uphill battle, when there's an organization that's struggling with some things, you know, how do you then begin to do that? Um, and there are different skills it may take, right? And for me, it could be one thing and for someone else it could be another, but the idea there becomes uh, being self-aware enough to know when you're being stretched and to be willing to step into that yeah. and to do it. And I absolutely agree with that idea. And I think it was um, Richard Branson. Sir Richard Branson made that statement that people quote, quote or attribute to him all the time about, you know, if you ever get an opportunity to do something and you don't think you can do it, say yes, and then figure it out when you get in it. I'm misquoting him too. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the, I, I think there's some value to that and the validity to that, because uh, again, the knowing comes in the going. And I think this was the issue that I had, and I kind of voiced this once in an organization about the ready now designation on a succession plan. Mm -hmm. My general, if you will, philosophical perspective on that is that if you're ready now, then we failed you and you don't already have the job. You yeah. know, and it's not to say that it's not to say that you don't want a lot of good ready now people in your role, but I'm presuming they're ready now for maybe a multitude of things and not just this one thing. If they're ready now for just this one thing and they're not already in it, then you may have already failed. Them. And they would, and you shouldn't be surprised if they go somewhere else where they can be in the role yeah, and not yeah. just ready. I, I think, um, you know, that designation almost shouldn't be there. It's, are you ready enough to take the leap? Um, and, and so if you're ready now, yeah, yeah, we've already missed our window with you. You may not know it, but we do. Oh, man. Are you ready enough? The I real question is, are they ready enough? And I think that's the thing that's going to be the most. Um, and I think as we think about our own careers and not leave those decisions and thoughts just to the organization we're in, but push them on that. I say, I think I'm ready for this. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and, you know, I could be wrong, but what I'm not going to do is not give myself the opportunity to, to, to take it on the basis of what I think and, and engage the people who could be sponsors to help me get that opportunity. So, yeah, I think, um, I think it's really about being ready enough. So really quickly, there, there's two things I need everyone to hear. If, if you have been teetering, internally on whether you are ready for your next opportunity. I, I, I really do hope that you, you rewind this back and listen to it again. Um, because this, you, this is what you need to be hearing. Um, I, I've talked to so many people who, who aren't moving forward because they, they feel like I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. I need to know everything before I move into this. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, like, so, so thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. and, and, and two, I, I want to, I want to, I want to acknowledge publicly that you're, you're now a sponsor of mine and, um, I saw a position <laughs> open in your team. So, um, I'm ready enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, that's, that's kind of how stuff happens for real. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, we got to raise our hands for stuff. <laughs> Hey, hey, Damien, thank you so much for your time today. I, I, I know, I know where our time is coming to an end, but I, I, I'd love to open the floor up to you. Is there any final thoughts, ideas, suggestions, job offers, anything you want to share um, with, the, <laughs> <laughs> with the audience? I like how you threw in job offers. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it, it's 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 important for you to. Um, I think believe in yourself and believe in what you could do um, and put yourself out there. I think there's some value to that. Um, uh, I had a, I once had a young man who um, I say young man, he's actually a little older than me, but um, he was started out in a part in a role um, uh, where he was kind of almost hidden. You know, um, he was very good at what he did, mm -hmm. but he didn't really, um, but he knew there was more to him. And then an opportunity came up, a role we'd never had before, uh, a profile that was created. 
he applied for it. And when he interviewed, there were other people who had some subject matter knowledge. There were people who had been in a similar type of role before. But what I noticed about him, and I, I had a role to play in the hiring of him, was that he had some skills that were transferable that were, I felt, critical for doing something new that had never been done before. He had, he had an entrepreneurial spirit. He had demonstrated that in things that had nothing to do with his job. Yeah. And this was a job he was going to have to create as he did it. And I thought, that's what I, that's what I want to select for. Um, and that's what I want to leverage. And I guess what I would encourage uh, people to do is just because you don't absolutely fit the specific profiles that you see uh, uh, of what they even think they want, look at your life, look at what you think it takes to do something like that and, and rethink it and reconsider because you may have some very transferable things that make you viable in a way far beyond people who may have even done it before. Right. And so I think, because it's not about what's been done, it's what needs to be done and what's mm -hmm. going to be done. And, it, and you might be the perfect candidate for what it could be, not for what someone else thought it should have been. And, and so don't limit yourself. Um, Think about what it is you want, look within, and then look without, and use a filter that's going to help create and shape the thinking of people uh, instead of feeling like you got to fit in the box that says job description 100%. <laughs> 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 no, you, you, th th look, thank you so much. This, yeah, no this has been phenomenal. Um, uh, I, I would say I hire you, but you know, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't got you. I mean, your gig, my gig, you may. <laughs> I know one thing: we'd have a lot of fun. It'd be great, and and you know, <laughs> if it's not fun, why why do it, right? Why, why do it? We, <laughs> we, we, you know, I, I, last thing I'll say actually is, um, I, I just happened to listen to, um, you know, David Gergen. Is it David Gergen? I don't know. Yeah, he, he's this guy. I think he does. It's not leadership stuff, but it's like intensity. He's he's famous for like being super intense, running like mm -hmm. 100, 100 mile marathons, da, 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 da. and he's he's doing this workout while he's doing this, this little um, little Instagram clip, and he says how and he says how time is fleeting consistently, time mm -hmm. never stops, and right. but yet sometimes we say, oh, do I want to work out? It's my birthday. Or right. I, I want to, should I work out? It's the weekend. We want to hang out. Like all these different reasons. He's like, all those reasons does not stop time from fleeting. So you're, okay. you're, you're burning your time regardless. You might as well be doing it, do using your time for something that's really important to you. Okay. Um, and so having fun while we're doing this stuff is important. And thank, thank you for creating this space, creating this space for us. Absolutely. Um, thank you Absolutely. so much, everyone. <sighs> you know, what's coming. If you found anything of value in today's talk, don't keep it to yourself. Don't say that person over there, that person over there should have been here. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't be that person. Don't, don't do that. Take this information to them. Don't just look back, reach back, bring them to the table to, to share this great knowledge with them and help them get the same learning and the impact that you had today. Make sure they have it too. So as always, stay strong, stay positive, and definitely stay moving. See ya. Whew. Thanks for listening to The Executive Appeal with Alex Trumbull. I invite you to follow The Executive Appeal wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow me, your host, Alex Trumbull, across all socials or via email for exclusive webinars, courses, and his speaking engagements on continued topics of executive leadership. So until next time, stay strong, stay positive, and definitely stay moving.